So um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking to you about, about this, uh, human skin. So it turns out about a third of my research group, generally involving something like maybe three or four PhDs and a postdoc or two, uh, are working on human skin, the ultimate biointerface. Uh, as you look at me and I look at you, we're looking at each other's skin, largest organ of your body by volume and by weight. And it's the interface between you and what for your body could be a very um, aggressive external environment. So it's shielding you from the uh, bacterial species, from viruses, and from chemical species in, in the outside world. Um, uh, it's shielding you from mechanical loads and tractions. Uh, we live in a physical world where there's weight and gravity that are applying forces to our body. And so your skin also has a very important mechanical function, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, 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 and the other thing is that it also controls water balance. So it turns out if it wasn't for your skin, uh, you would immediately dehydrate and within just a few hours, even in a normal, pleasant San Francisco 45% relative humidity environment, you would dehydrate and die very quickly. So uh, all of that is done by your skin. This, this particular picture here came uh, in a press uh, release uh, by NPR after we published a paper in uh, PANS, which is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that dealt with the effect specifically of, of, of solar radiation and particularly UV radiation on your skin. And at the end of my little talk today, uh, I'll tell you about that, that story. But this is, this is what the, the press decided to actually show on that. So um, we all have one. Some of us are thin-skinned. <laughs> some of us are thick-skinned. And you know those people. Um, but so what, what's the deal with your skin? Uh, it turns out. Uh, if you look at the overall structure of skin, it's shown over here, this is about two millimeters thick. Depends on body location. Some, some locations have thicker skin and, and, and some less. Some people have thinner skin, as I just mentioned, some thicker. Um, and it's made up of a fairly complex structure. Um, here, this bottom layer over here is the dermal layer. And this is embedded in the dermal layer are a lot of hair follicles and mechanoreceptors and other nerve structures, vascular structures, that, that are very important in the regenerative processes of your skin. Getting further up to this region over here, maybe a third of the thickness of the skin is the epidermal layers, where some very profound changes in the cells of your skin begin to occur. Uh, going all the way to this last a region up over here, which is only 15 microns in thickness. So you know, roughly on the order of the thickness of, of your hair, the diameter of, of a hair, um, is this top layer uh, called the stratum corneum. So this is a super thin layer, uh, covers your entire body. In fact, mostly when you're looking at me, you're looking at my stratum corneum with the influence of underlying pigmentation that you're seeing through. Um, but this layer is one of the most critical layers in your entire skin structure, and in fact, in your entire body. It is the barrier between the outside world, between all of the species, chemical or biological species that are, exist in the outside world, um, uh, and your, the, the interior workings of your body. Um, it is profoundly important in controlling the water balance of your body. And this turns out to be a very, very important thing. And I'm going to come back and talk about this because all these feelings and perceptions that we have of our skin are often exactly related uh, to the water content in this barrier layer here. Um, now, now here, here's a blow-up picture of the stratum corneum, and you can see these, uh, these things over here are cells. Uh, now, they're not living cells. They used to be living cells, but as they move into the stratum corneum layer, they, they lose the nucleus, so they, they don't reproduce in the way a normal cell would. 
but they basically slowly come off uh, in a process that's called disclamation. And, and if you have a treatment, a beauty treatment, an exfoliation treatment, for example, what that's doing is to strip off the top layers of the stratum corneum. Okay, but not all of the layers, because you would die. <laughs> really, you would absolutely die. So, you know, they would strip off no more than a few of these cell layers going down into the stratum corneum here. And, and so this, this is a very important process uh, of renewal of the stratum corneum. Basically, this top outer layer renews itself every two weeks. It completely turns over. Um, and, and this is the reason that, you know, for example, if you go into a clean room, you see these people in bunny suits. It's to keep all of these cells from getting into the environment. Uh, and in fact, so we're sharing these cells with each other all the time. There's somebody in the room here you don't like. You're breathing them the whole time. <laughs> when you leave here, that person that you dislike is all inside of you. And there's no <laughs> ways that you can get rid of that. You have millions, billions of these cells coming off all the time. And it's a profoundly important process. If it is interrupted through disease or through genetic defects, it leads to some of the most terrible skin conditions. So th this little outer layer, um, the stratum corneum, has this, this profound importance. Now, I, I got interested in skin about nearly 20 years ago when I had a program looking at new technologies to deliver medications through the stratum corneum and through skin, so-called transdermal drug delivery. And many of you know these. There's nicotine patches, for example, and other um, uh, devices that can dose medication through the skin. So we, we became interested in skin, ultimately, because this is what you're adhering to. And I was shocked to discover that there was very little understood about the biomechanical function of skin, the sort of mechanics of it. Uh, how stiff is it? Um, how much does it have any stress in it? How do you adhere to it? Uh, and so that's what started our research in uh, the biomechanical function of skin. Uh, but, but it turned out very quickly um, and inadvertently uh, we got involved in all sorts of other areas that, that were affected by understanding the, the, the biomechanical function of skin. Uh, one of them was wound care. And um, I, I actually got a call from somebody in the medical school 15, 16 years ago now, and um, he said, could he come over and talk to me about mechanics of skin? And I said yes, and he came into my office and we, we discussed, and in a one hour meeting, we thought of a whole new technology to control scar formation in humans. So um, uh, it turns out uh, humans, mammalian species, over-scar more than any other mammal. And it's an evolutionary prerogative. It's critical. If you don't form a scar and heal the wound very quickly, you'll die. And so uh, we do that very effectively, but unfortunately, we do it with these big hypertrophic scars. And yeah, I'm, I almost guarantee everybody sitting here has got a scar somewhere. Whenever I start talking about this, people in my office say, oh, I have a scar, and they start <laughs> opening up. I'm like, it's okay, I've seen a lot of those. <laughs> but um, it, it turns out that this process of scarring is very deeply connected to the biomechanics of skin. It turns out that because skin remodels itself under mechanical stress constantly, then if you stress skin more, it turns out that it remodels quicker and the scars get larger. And this has been known for a long time, although never quantified, by um, surgeons who know how to make incisions in certain directions to get the least amount of scarring. And there's certain body locations where you just inherently have higher mechanical stress. And so you would develop more scar. And so we had an idea um, based on work that, that I had been doing and that, was he, that, he, uh, that he had been doing, that if we could control this environment, maybe we could downregulate scarring. And so the idea we had was, uh, here is the skin. Uh, it's got stress in it. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about stress in a minute. Here's a, here's a wound that's healing. 
Um, how about we, we deploy a device uh, on the top of the skin, sort of stretch it out, and then adhere it to skin and let it go, um, and, and it would control the underlying stresses in the skin and downregulate the scarring. And so we did that, and it worked. Uh, and, and it didn't just work a little bit. It worked by an order of magnitude, which is very rare in these kind of, of, of studies. So it was a, sort of a long story here. We did some, some very nice work in the, uh, uh, through the Stanford Hospital and through our animal facility uh, working on red duroc pigs. I, in fact, I became the, probably the West Coast expert <laughs> on red duroc pigs. It turns out they heal closest to humans. But finding purebred red duroc pigs was, was a challenge. And the animal facility here couldn't get them. And I found a herd in Idaho. <laughs> and I would call this farmer every morning. It was, it was the weirdest thing. You'd hear these pigs going crazy in the background. Anyway, we, we flew four of these baby pigs in. And we did some really beautiful studies to show just how profoundly successful this technique could be. Uh, anyway, based on that, um, and you know, here are some examples then. We, we, we basically, this got spun out uh, of Stanford, and um, um, the um, technology was then demonstrated in clinical trials on humans. And, and here are two examples. These are mostly plastic surgery examples of breast reconstruction surgery and abdominoplasty. It, on, on both sides here are the control wounds. So something like an abdominoplasty, you've got an enormous incision, so you can test the device on one side and leave the other side as a control. And, and we did that. Um, uh, uh, and you can see here the massive difference. Here are these very large scars that were the control scars. Of course, you have two breasts too, so you've got a control and a, uh, a shielded side. And you can see the, the marked reduction. So th this really worked. And fundamentally, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is just how important these stresses are in your skin, uh, that they control these remodeling and scarring processes. And anyway, this has been very successful. I'm, I won't go through all the details here. It's now commercially available and uh, is being used. It got FDA approval a couple of years ago, which was a very, very fast track for approval based on a single one-hour meeting with somebody who was interested in plastic surgery and regenerative medicine and somebody who was interested in the biomechanics of skin. And you put that two, those two together uh, and a, a real, I think, a real success story. So, so that's the, one of the, 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 the reasons that, that the, the biomechanical function of skin is so important. But it's also important for a range of other applications. And um, so I'm going to talk about these other applications now, particularly things like skin care and cosmetics. And, I, and I'll mention a little bit um, aspects of wearable electronics. Let me just go back here and, and show this picture here. Uh, we're all familiar, of course, with cosmetics, and so I'm going to say things about that now, uh, tell you why you feel the way you do when you put certain things on your skin. Um, uh, but it, it's also very important going forward uh, for areas like wearable electronics. We, all these kind of low-tech things we already know about, right? You have things that you strap on yourself. But true wearable electronics are getting very close. We now can build semiconductor devices out of stretchable plastic materials. It's a significant focus in my group and in many other groups. And being able to adhere them to your body um, is a very important frontier for uh, technology development. Um, all sorts of things you can do, not just monitoring physiological conditions. Of course, there's some of those monitors are already available. But doing other things, um, uh, for example, communicating through your skin. You have a patch on your skin. You're sitting having dinner with somebody, and suddenly they have a glazed look in their eye. In the meantime, they're having a conversation, basically tactile conversation uh, through a device that's adhered to your skin. So these, these things are getting close. Um, so let me, let me talk now about that aspect of the work, uh, uh, how cosmetic treatments in the sun affect skin. Sun, that's going to be a big one coming up. So, I, you know, I don't do any of this work. And I acknowledge here the fantastic 
students that we have at Stanford and postdocs who actually do all of this work. I, I get the fun of standing here and, and talking about it, but really these are the folks that are doing it. You can see the, the students in my group at the moment, PhD students, former PhDs, and a whole slew of undergrads and masters. It, th this topic has enormous sex appeal to students. They all, they're like, oh, human skin. Yeah, we all got one. Everybody wants to work on it. So we've had no shortage of people that, that want to work in this area. So here's the, here's, the, here's the kind of picture that I want to create for you today. This, again, here, here's your skin, this, this two millimeter thick um, layer. We, we've talked about the stratum corneum, which is this top layer on the top here, uh, and then the underlying layers. And I've already mentioned just how important that very top layer is. And so I'm going to take you a little deeper into that area. And I'm going to do it mostly without equations. And I can do that because I give this kind of a talk a lot to biochemical communities and physiological community. And those people don't like equations. You put equations up there and it, 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 you have that. So, so I can do this without equations. But I, but I want to show you that we can make it precise. This is actually very important that you, 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 you uh, certainly what we've done is to help make the formulation of products much more quantitative with real quantitative understanding and models. And what I'm specifically going to focus on is the stratum corneum because that's where you're deploying cosmetics. They diffuse into the stratum corneum. There's no such thing as a cosmetic that, that doesn't get into the epidermal layers. Everything goes through the stratum corneum to some level, which, by the way, is, is also why when you go into the store and you see these boxes of special salts and the stuff that's going to draw out poisons and you know, you're going to be able to express them, it's all, well, I'm on TV. <laughs> it can't be, because if you did that, you would die. Okay, your whole stratum corneum is there. M millions of years of evolution to make sure that all the stuff doesn't go flying out of your body <laughs> and a whole bunch of other stuff does come in your body. Mostly it's olfactory. You're smelling eucalyptus. It's wonderful. But if you suddenly start dosing massive doses of eucalyptus through your skin, you'll die. So um, this, this barrier here is tremendously important. And what I want to show you is how water loss through the stratum corneum controls so much of how you feel, uh, and then how cosmetic treatments that can diffuse into the skin can be used to adjust that feeling and to control that kind of water balance. And, and I'll say a little bit about measuring things like the, the resistance that this skin has to failing, and it'll be this number here, GC, uh, units of joules per meter squared. Yeah, how, how, how much energy you need to actually break skin. And, and then this unit here is, you know, these, there's stresses in skin, mechanical stresses, not psychological stresses. Although, if you Google, and we did this, we've done this a lot, when you Google, if you're studying mechanical properties of skin and you put stress, because mechanical stress and skin into Google, you get tons of articles, but it's all psychological stress. It's not mechanical stress. And what we're dealing with here is mechanical stress. So these mechanical stresses that develop provide a driving force for damage. And so we want to understand this balance, because if this driving force gets bigger than the resistance, then you, you have chapping and cracking and damage processes that begin to occur. So here, here's some early work that we did. This was done by a student, Ken Wu, in my group, where um, we took human skins. All the work we do is on human skin. I'll show you a little bit how we, we get it and separate it. Uh, um, and, and here, what we've done is take just the stratum corneum and measure the stress as a function of the strain. What does this mean? It means we take a piece of skin and we put it in a special test system. We kind of stretch it, stretch it like this. This stretching is the strain here. The more you strain it, the more you're stretching it, right? And then at the same time, you have to pull harder and harder to, to stretch it like an elastic band. And so the stresses go up. Okay? And one of the things we found that was really interesting was this was kind of a linear. It's like a straight line here. The more you strain, the more the stresses go up linearly. And that wasn't expected because biological tissue like human skin is very nonlinear. You kind of stretch it a little bit and it's easy and then you stretch some more and then it gets much harder. So it's kind of a nonlinear response. And so we, we showed it was actually very linear. 
But more importantly, if you do the test in a wet environment, 100% relative humidity, you get a curve that looks like this. And as you make the, the environment drier and drier, so this is just the, the air humidity, we have chambers that can control this, this line gets s steeper and steeper. What this means is you have to pull much harder, much quicker here to, to get it to deform. The skin has become stiffer. It's like taking an elastic band and going and then taking like three elastic bands, right? It's much stiffer. If you didn't know how many elastic bands were there, you would just say, this thing I'm pulling on is getting stiffer. What's profound about our stratum corneum is how sensitive it is to the relative humidity. If it wasn't for this change in the stiffness, most of the moisturizing cosmetic industry wouldn't exist. It's because your skin gets super stiff when it gets dry. And that's part of what you're feeling, the stiffness. It's also much stiffer than the overall skin layers. They're much more compliant. So it's like this thin little membrane that's so profoundly stiff that it's affecting this whole big underlying tissue. Yeah, you know, and we've done, over the years, we've done lots of studies. So we've, we've looked at humans from, you know, in their, thir in their 20s all the way to their 90s. And what we find is your skin gets stiffer and tougher as you get older. So it's true. You do get stiffer and tougher. Um, but what, what we've been able to do now is to take the, this kind of understanding of how to measure skin properties and the, the strength and the toughness and the stiffness and put it into models that can explain, for example, why when you sit in the bath too long on the tips of your fingers and on the soles of your foot, do you get these little wrinkles? It, it's a buckle. It's just little buckling instabilities. Your water, the stratum corneum, is absorbing so much water, it's trying to expand, and it can't, so it buckles. But more damaging and more worrying is if, the, if tensile stresses, if these pulling stresses develop because the skin is drying out or it's become sun damage, for example, they can cause chapping and cracking. And it turns out that through other work we do in, in thin film devices and, and, and composite systems, we can write down very quantitative expressions and models that can tell you when this will happen and when that will happen. And so a part of our innovation has been doing that on, on human skin. And, and so we only work on human skin. We don't work on animal skin. Uh, I accidentally made this, this uh, decision early on. If I'd have known how complex it was going to be, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I did anyway, and I'm so glad I did because we now have a full uh, capability to deal with human tissue. We receive full thickness human tissue with all the underlying layers. And one of the things that my graduate students have to learn early on is how to separate that very carefully so that we can take off the very top layers of the skin. And then we go through various procedures so that we can separate down to different layers. So you can see here the stratum corneum has got the epidermal layer on. Here it's just sitting by itself. Here it's got some of the dermis. Uh, on. And we can do all of that very, very precisely and keep the tissue in a, in a viable condition so that we can then uh, do all of our studies. And so here, coming back to this picture, what we want to do is figure out how this water loss, I've already showed you that, that if you change the water just in the environment, your skin gets really stiff, right? which is what your experience is. You go to Texas in summer, and they have the air conditioning t turned up to freezing which means that it's pulled all the moisture out of the air. And so you sitting in a room uh, under those air conditioning, well, your skin starts to feel stiff. It's because it's just getting really stiff. It really is. Mechanically, you can measure it. Um, uh, and, and so I'll show you how we can measure that and model it and predict it, and then how we can do the same thing for treatments. Um, so, OK, so the science stuff. Yeah, we can do science at Stanford. I'll even show you in a little while we can even solve equations. But you know, we have instruments that can make very precise measurements. And, and actually, a lot of what we've done in this area has, has been to innovate the use of these techniques on human skin. They might be used 
in other areas of, of material science or device physics, but they hadn't been used on human skin. And so we can use techniques, spectroscopies, that can measure, for example, the water content or the other uh, conformation of molecules in your skin and how they change with temperature, and we, we can do all of that. And we get data, and we pore over it and, and agonize about it. And I go back and forth with students with varying degrees of success to try and figure out what it means, and we can, we can measure things. Uh, we can also measure the stresses that developed. And this was the first time that this had been done, measuring these stresses in human skin. And this is what we found, okay? Now, let me show you what we're showing here. This is an experiment to measure the mechanical stress in the stratum corneum layer when it dries. So you go into this Texas air-conditioned environment or just any dry environment, and what we found is here's the stress. I'm going to talk about these units in a, in a minute. Megapascal uh, as a function of time. And you can see that as you put this uh, tissue into a dry environment, uh, at first nothing happens, and then it starts suddenly to dry. And I already showed you it gets stiff, right? But not only does it get stiff, it actually starts to develop stresses. It tries to contract, but it's stuck to the rest of you. And so it, it gets these tensile stresses in it. OK, they go up to 4.5 megapascal. What does that mean? The hell is a megapascal? Who knows what a pascal is? Because a, a megapascal is a million pascals. What's a pascal? It's, it's a unit of pressure. You know when you pump your tires in the car and you see the gauge, it says um, PSI, that's pounds per square inch. This is just the sort of metric equivalent. The unit is pascal. It's newtons per meter squared. So one pascal is one newton sitting on a one meter square surface. Okay. Now, what's a newton? He was that guy that sat under an apple tree, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out for every pound, most of you know what a pound is, right? For every pound, there's 4.4 newtons. So now what's a newton? No, we're getting, we're getting closer there. So a newton now for me, is an apple, about an apple. Go, go, next time you go to the supermarket, pick a decent-sized apple. That's a Newton. Take that apple, put it on one square meter of anything, and feel that. That's one Pascal. Okay. Mega Pascal. Your skin develops four and a half million apples per square meter, right? Killer Pascal would be a thousand apples. There's probably nobody in the room that could hold this thing with a thousand apples up there. Now I'm going to put a million apples. It's going to flatten you. And yet when you dry your skin, it drives, dries up to four and a half million apples per square meter in your skin, in this top layer. That's a hell of a lot of stress. No wonder you feel stressed. What could help? Increasing your pay, obviously. Scott is sitting right here. <laughs> Improving benefits. Scott is sitting right here. We have a solution right here. Well, it, it turns out that this effect, though, comes from drying. As you dry the skin and you lose moisture content, the skin is trying to contract and it's developing these massive stresses. At the same time, it's becoming very stiff. And that's why you feel stiff. You really are stiff. You're not just a little stiff. You're hellish stiff. In fact, when we first made these measurements, we didn't believe them because they were so high. Now, the next thing you can do is say, what's the effect of a treatment? Well, now what we can do is rehydrate the tissue so it comes back down to zero stress, apply some treatment. We can put anything we like on the skin and then redo the experiment and look how huge the effect a cosmetic treatment can have. There might be an increase in stress to a, a lower peak stress and then it goes all the way back down to zero. And that's the secret of moisturizing treatments. That's how they work. So we have published many studies in this area 
Um, we, we are by far the preeminent group in the world in being able to characterize these effects and really show what they do. And, and here is a results of a study we did a number of years ago on a whole bunch of different molecules that are called emollient molecules. And they're in nearly every single skin treatment, cosmetic, moisturizing treatment that you use. You know when you're walking down the aisle in Safeway or somewhere and you see all of these cosmetic treatments and they've got willow bark and cocoa beans and all that lovely stuff. That's the marketing department. Those are called their actives in terms of what they're going to sell it around. But the real formulation, what's called the chassis, you know, like the chassis of a car, that's what the whole formulation's built on. And it doesn't care about whether it's got bamboo shoot in it or not. Bamboo shoot's not doing anything, but it is making for nice packaging. The rest of the chassis, though, has got these kind of molecules in them. And they have been studied for years and years and years um, in order to optimize the way they can help moisturizing skin. That's really what does it. The rest of the stuff is just packaging. So here are the results of professional panels that put these emollients on them and then describe how they feel. And I love this. When we first got this, we would read these things. Uh, a very dry, non-greasy, transient feel. The hell does that mean? Or you know, a, an initial feel, low viscosity, uh, medium afterfeel, as opposed to the transient feel. Uh, my favorite here is the initial feel with lubricious afterfeel. Who would not want to have a lubricious afterfeel? <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were just blown away by these things. This is, people are describing perception, right? It's the, these molecules that are diffusing in, like those little red dots I showed you, into the skin to affect their properties. We could now measure them. And so we set out in this early study to make those measurements. And here are the same kind of stress measurements that I just showed you here, all the controls. And here are all of those molecules. And look what on earth did they do to all of these stresses following the um, application of the treatment. No wonder they had lubricious afterfeels or transient feels, because you're getting up to this little peak over here and then coming down like a roller coaster. So for the, for the very first time, we were able to actually make these measurements and show what, on, what was going on in your skin, what was happening. It really is these, this, this tension that's changing in your skin so profoundly. So, so this has been a very important area of work. And I, I'm not going to show you all the technical details, but one of the things we're really focusing on at the moment is exactly how do you perceive this? How does this... How does the ability to measure these things in such exquisite detail, and these aren't just the only measurements, we make lots of other measurements, how does that translate into your perception? Uh, very, very important uh, area of, of research that also affects other technologies where you're wanting to communicate, for example, with, uh, through skin. So just to show you that we, we do actually know how to solve equations, um, here are some models that we've developed, or these kind of things over there, that can help predict the behavior that we see. This is the, the final model that we've got over here. And all of these little quantities and parameters can be, can be measured. There's, there's nothing that's fit here. We, we plug things in, and then we let it go. And one of the things we've been able to do here, here's these drying curves. These are the stresses in, in different relative humidity environments. And these are the model predictions. Oh, come on, give it up, cool. <laughs> you know how hard it is to get to that point? We can actually predict with the model how these stresses are going to change. And we've recently taken that to the point of being able to predict these strange effects that different molecules can have. So we, we're getting to the sort of place where you can do predictive modeling instead of having to go out and do huge consumer trials or patient trials with different molecules, different formulations, we can actually mathematically begin to predict those effects. And so let, let me come back quickly here, and, and I'm getting towards the end of my talk. Uh, remember this, this energy balance I showed earlier on? This is the resistance the skin has to damage, and this is the, the result of these stresses that are basically causing the damage. Uh, we've been able to actually 
make measurements and then predict whether certain treatments will stop things like, like um, um, uh, cracking and chapping of skin. I mean, the, like the things that you commonly experience on your lip, your lips. So here are, this is a glycerol treatment, one of the sort of gold standards in moisturizing. This is just a water treatment, deionized water. And this is a surfactant, really nasty surfactant, sodium dodecyl sulfate. So you can see here, all of these quantities are elevated. And then if we look at this balance over here, if we take this quantity to this side, then when this number here gets bigger than one, uh, this dotted line over here, it means that damage will occur. And when it gets less than one, uh, damage will not occur. And, and so again, we were able to predict when a moisturizing treatment either would prevent damage in the form of chapping and cracking, or would actually make it worse for damaging treatments. And we could do the same thing with those, um, all of those emollient molecules. And we've done it for many other treatments too. So in the, in the skin science community, nothing like this had ever been done, uh, not anywhere close. So th this was a, a, a significant advance. OK, let me, let me end with just a few words about the sun. If I could leave you with any advice here, if you don't want to look older, stay out of the sun. It's really as simple as that. It is by far the most damaging and aging factor in human existence. So we should all immediately go into a dark room and never come out, <laughs> in which case we'll all die of vitamin D deficiency. So it's kind of this horrible balance that you have to have some sunlight or some light in order to create vitamin D, uh, otherwise you would die. Um, but if you get too much sun, then you will start to age prematurely, and of course there's many other diseases associated with sun. So this is a, a photo of a truck driver. And uh, driving a truck his entire career, uh, one side of his face was facing the outside window, and so was sun exposed, this side over here, and this side over here was in the interior of the cab, and so had less sun exposure. And you can see immediately um, the very marked difference in the appearance of his skin through to even more significant effects in the underlying muscle tone that even there's relaxation of the underlying muscle tone and drooping of the eye uh, related to this, the sun exposure. So the, the effects of sun exposure are huge. Um, and they're very important um, in understanding it so that we can not get too exposed, but also in terms of developing uh, treatments um, that would prevent uh, over sun exposure, all the sunscreens that we, we use. So this, again, was an area that had not received a lot of attention in terms of the things that, that we studied, which is the, 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 the barrier function and the, the mechanical stresses that form in skin. And so we were able to measure um, what happens when you expose the skin to UVA or UVB exposure. This, these studies here were done with UVB exposure. Turns out this is an area where we do a lot of research in terms of photovoltaic devices because they put out in the sun and expect it to live for 30 years. Um, so we could use the same methods in, in human skin. And, and what we found was that, this is this quantity GC, the skin becomes weaker very quickly when you UV expose it. So it becomes weaker. Um, um, actually, you, you can't strain it much and it'll, before it fails, too. So it's becoming mechanically weaker. And as I'll show you in a minute, at the same time, it's getting higher stresses. But before I do that, let me just show you that if you use a sunscreen, so we can do these same experiments where we, we do an exposure as a control, we see what the properties look like. You can see here they are. Here is the, um, a carrier uh, with sunscreen, but no UV exposure. And here's the carrier, that's the chassis, the cream, uh, with a sunscreen with a whole heck of a lot of exposure, but there's no change in properties. Sunscreens really work very effectively. Big problem with sunscreens, are you need to keep reapplying them. People put them on, and then you spend the rest of the day, and you're fine, right? Yeah, you're fine for about an hour. Uh, and then, then it's, it's much less effective for a whole host of reasons. Um, and here is just the carrier with no sunscreen, and here you see the big drop. 
so, so what we can do in this work is also show just how effective these um, sunscreens are. So the uh, main message here is your skin gets weaker, just the, the, the flat out gets weaker. And then when we measure the stress, the mechanical stress in the skin, as you increase the amount of UV exposure, the stress goes up. So wait a minute. It's getting weaker, but at the same time, the stress is going up. OK, you know what that means. It's, it's, it's going to fail. Right? And it's going to chap and crack. And you're going to get all of the kind of damage that you typically see with sun exposure. So we were able to put this into a model and do some mathematics and, and modeling of the process and make predictions. And this is the, the paper that I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk showing how this, this, this cracking and damage occurs. And this is the amount of UV exposure here. So this is getting more and more exposure. This line over here means the threshold between no damage and damage. And the way we cross this threshold here is just over one day of full Florida sun. And that maps exactly onto what's clinically observed. So we were able to put that onto a very firm mechanical basis and actually demonstrate how um, this uh, causes damage in skin. So, that, that's what we're doing in this area. Um, again, I wanted to thank you, Son, so much for inviting me to be here. Thank you for all of your efforts. Um, just like I acknowledged our graduate students, you, you guys are really the backbone of what makes this whole enterprise work. And thank you so, so much. And thank you for being polite and listening to me. <laughs> thank you.